has conveyed to the Supreme Court that its decision to accept the International Arbitration Tribunal Award, which ruled that Italy, not India, would try the Italian Marines involved in the Enrica Lexi case. The court ruled that New Delhi could seek compensation for the deaths of the fishermen who were killed in the incident off the Kerala coast. Two Italian Marines had opened fire on an Indian fishing boat in 2012, killing two crew members. The case had become a major bone of contention between the two countries, with India insisting that it could try them as the incident occurred in its territorial waters. Italy contested this on the ground that the ship flew an Italian flag and hence the crew would be tried under the Italian law. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the Italian Marines case and its impact on bilateral ties between India and Italy. Joining me on the programme today are Jitendra Nath Mishra, former ambassador, Sheetal Sharma, Assistant Professor, Center for European Studies, JNU, and uh, Abhishek Jabaraj, Supreme Court Advocate and International Law Expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. All right, Abhishek, let me start the program with you first. Let's try and understand and analyze the key aspects of the verdict of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. Uh, thanks. thanks, Frank. I think when you look at any dispute, whether it's domestic or international, uh, there are two key aspects that one needs to look at. One is what were the facts uh, and secondly, what was the law in this particular case? Well, the undisputed facts was that on 15 February 2012, you had two Indian fishermen on an Indian fishing vessel who were shot uh, dead by two Italian Marines uh, on an Italian oil tanker. Uh, these are the undisputed facts that had occurred around 20 nautical miles off the coast of uh, Kerala. Uh, now, the, the disputed facts, and let me just give you very quickly the, the Italian uh, narrative and what the Indian narrative was before the PCA. Uh, now, Italy claimed uh, that the, this oil tanker was uh, very prone to pirate attacks, uh, and these two Italian Marines were actually suspicious of the Indian fishing vessel being pirates. They were asked to change their course once or twice. They didn't listen. Uh, and therefore, they had no option but to shoot at these two marines. And then uh, the ship was uh, arrested illegally and they were not supposed to be brought back forcefully to Indian land and arrested. Of course, they claimed immunity and other things. Uh, the Indian perspective of the facts was that this Indian fishing vessel was fully within their rights to be fishing in that zone. It's Indian territorial waters that there was absolutely no uh, piracy attack. So there was absolutely they were not in the way of the Italian uh, vessel in any way, and uh, this was absolutely reckless on part of the Italian Marines. They have no immunity in this particular case, and this was the Indian uh, narrative brought before the court. Now, on on the law, I think very broadly, there were there were three legal principles that this was being fought over. Uh, the first principle was that uh, the freedom of navigation on the seas. Uh, of course, the seas you have uh, seas that are very contiguous to a particular land that belong to a, a, a nation's own territory, and then as you go out from the seas, uh, since time immemorial, there have been disputes about uh, you know wh whose right of way is on the sea. So this freedom of navigation becomes very important. That was a key uh, issue before the court. The second issue that was really on the table. Uh, was the, the issue of territorial jurisdiction. Uh, now that this incident has occurred, who, which country really gets to try the case? Which country gets to arrest and investigate on this particular issue? That was a key fight. Uh, the third key fight was the issue of diplomatic immunity, uh, which, uh, again, under international law principles, uh, to develop uh, smooth relations between states and ensure that international relations move smoothly, you have the whole concept uh, where foreign officials in a foreign state uh, are immune uh, from being tried by uh, the domestic law of the country that they're in. Uh, so this third issue of uh, immunity came up on the table. Now, in India's favor, the court has unanimously held that there was an innocent killing of life, and this shooting was absolutely unwarranted that India is entitled to compensation, and its right mm -hmm. of freedom of navigation has been violated by Italy. And I think there was a unanimous verdict on that. What that vindicates actually for India is our stand with the facts uh, that this wasn't a boat that was uh, being a threat uh, to the Italian vessel in any way. So that's that's one key part of the ruling. Now, coming to the issue on who gets to try this case and whether there was diplomatic immunity, I do want to lay out that it was a very close call between three, three judges to two uh, on the court. And as far as the territorial jurisdiction was concerned, 
they held one. Uh, actually, to switch the order around, diplomatic immunity uh, was accorded to these Italian marines because they were in official duty protecting a vessel uh, under the Italian flag. And because right. they had immunity to be tried under Indian law, therefore, right. Italy gets jurisdiction to try these marines and India will have to seize its jurisdiction. Okay, all right. So, these were the key legal issues really as far as this particular case is concerned is what uh, uh, the advocate is suggesting and we heard that from Abhishek, of course, taking the discussion forward now. Ambassador, so what is the history of the issue and what have the diplomatic highlights been over the last eight years between India and Italy? Well, the history and the diplomatic uh, effects uh, stem from um, the points of view of the two sides. Basically, that India said that um, Indian courts can try them because it comes under Indian jurisdiction and the Italians claimed immunity. So that was the big diplomatic and political tussle between the two sides. And of course, uh, the Italians were very surprised, to say the least, that uh, these two individuals were picked up by the Indian authorities and brought to India from what the Italians claimed were international waters, where Italian law uh, would uh, come into force. Now, uh, so this went up and down, and I think uh, the issue got trapped in uh, nationalism and prestige on both sides. I would say it got also enmeshed in the domestic politics of Italy, even more than India. In India, it was more Kerala than all of India that was excited about it. But in Italy, it became a national issue and it caused great outrage. So obviously, the political effect of that was going to be felt without any doubt. What happened? Well, our ambassador uh, between 2014 and 2016, I was in Portugal. And I know that our ambassador in Italy did not see anybody in the government. It was very difficult to have access. And he was treated as somebody not to be met, not to be engaged at all. And uh, our cooperation across the board, it did a lot of damage to our ties at that particular moment in time. So the political and the diplomatic effects are very clear. And then, as you know, the International Tribunal uh, uh, on Law, of the, sea, the ITLOS, uh, gave the ruling in uh, 2015. And in a way, India had a escape clause because um, they went to Italy, they had to come back to India, and ultimately they went back to Italy. So my sense is, and I have no evidence to suggest this, my sense is that Indians were quite, in a way, quite accepting of the fact that they went back to Italy. It was a problem of the back because India would have allowed them uh, to be uh, tied in India, of course, but uh, the sentence could be in Italy. You know, I think there was some kind of informal standing, though I don't have any evidence, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, official on this. So uh, this damaged the ties, and then what happens uh, at the bilateral level, as well as the multilateral level? Please recall that uh, Federica Mogherini, the EU czar for foreign affairs, the high representative for foreign affairs, he was uh, elected, uh, nominated, elected in uh, 2014. And what happens? She immediately has a statement made, and she's Italian, and she has a statement made by the EU that uh, they had been held without charges and their human rights were violated. So there was a degree right. of confirmation. And the EU summit also got postponed by year year. So she was very much responsible for this at that point of time. So damage at the bilateral level, damage at the multilateral level. I'll stop here because the effects of that and what has been done now is the next point. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Shital Sharma, let me bring you into the picture now. And, you know, the ambassador took us through the history, really, and took us through the eight years of how this effect, if, affected the ties between uh, India and Italy. What is the current status of the ties between the two nations? Frank, if we talk about the bilateral between India and Italy, it has to be understood on two uh, plates. One bilateral and one Italy being part of the European Union. So if we begin by just understanding the bilateral between India and Italy, 
it's okay you know smooth kind of a friendly relationship not very robust if you see in terms of trade because we tend to measure two things very importantly in terms of the number of people those who are in a particular nation and the trade so the volume of trade is hovering around 8 to 9.5 billion euros per year so one factor is the trade which is okay not very good because there is much of the potential which is underutilized or there is scope for exploiting it further number 2 if we talk of the diaspora which is present in it which is around uh, 180000 people so uh, it's okay now the momentum that we had with italy we have to also see that what are the areas in which this bilateral could have stepped up and there is a potential because as ambassador was saying for a long period of time uh, four to five years after the incident it was on freeze but then there was a uh, there was an effort to bring back things to normalcy from 2016 onwards now why do we need to bring back to normalcy because one italy as a stand alone partner and second italy as the part of the european union in this particular case as mogrini swung into action as soon as these people uh, you know got into this uh, tussle now uh, one thing which very important comes out here that i would say i personally feel that it is more active in saving its citizens as compared to india because we mismanaged some of the things uh, right from the beginning 2012 uh, when it all started and there were two important things which were uh, like a turning point and which went slightly uh, you know uh, in favor of italy one was that uh, this case was given some to certain in, uh, level investigations by nia and nia had slapped a particular act which is suppression of uh, exploitation and all that so uh, nia and the, the 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 judgment for that was the death penalty and when death penalty was pronounced or uh, announced eu as a normative actor which has done away with capital punishment swung into action and they got sympathy towards uh, the italian marines so one was this the second was mogrini's uh, proactive uh, uh, you know role in mobilizing all the member states of the european union because italy is systematically systemically very important for the european union okay all right taking the discussion forward now you know uh, uh, Abhishek, you spoke about right to navigation and freedom of movement in the seas, and even the ambassador spoke about unclos. So let's talk about the unclos and the role it played, really, in determining the merits of this particular case. Sure, Prime. With uh, with the unclos, I think just going back to the history, I think for a long time, ever since we came up with the whole idea of nation states. Uh, and the West Westphalian model of states disputes on waters has been uh, multifold. There have been security considerations across waters. There has been uh, issues with freedom of trade. There have been issues with who gets rights to minerals and resources in the seas. And in order to foster cooperation among all the all the member nations of the United Nations, this particular convention actually in Closet it went through a series. of steps a series of around treaty negotiations uh, but really uh, in the early 1980s is when uh, unclos as we have it today uh, developed now some of the key principles in unclos and i think one of the this is uh, important for territorial sovereignty of nations is really now coming up to a clear definition of what areas of of the waters uh, falls within the sovereignty of a particular nation so in any state if you have a coastal state you take it's, it's a baseline Uh, that's where the land comes to an end a uh, 12 nautical miles from there uh, really belongs to that nation that has full sovereignty over it and no other ship or a vessel can enter into it uh, just cannot claim the right of passage they need to get permission to come into this sacred space of 12 nautical miles called the territorial waters as you go out from there uh, again a, a nation state has a lot of a uh, jurisdiction even as you go out from there in something called the economic uh, economic zone the exclusive economic zone uh, which really in this particular case uh, was where the fishing uh, the, sorry the italian vessel and the fishing vessel were both found in this exclusive economic zone uh, so unclos really lays a foundation uh, to say where member states can really exercise their territory it also comes up very clearly uh, with uh, on vessels which which laws jurisdiction will apply so it's very clear right. that if you have a particular vessel Uh, if that vessel is carrying a state flag, uh, that's that the laws of that nation is going to apply on the, that vessel. Uh, so that's another thing that comes across in terms of security. Uh, how does piracy operate? Uh, and then, very importantly, uh, a way and a means to resolve these disputes that arise. 
And the, there's uh, Article 287 of the UNCLOS that lays out uh, various ways in which disputes can be resolved. There's a, there's a tribunal set up uh, to adjudicate on the laws of the seas. You have the permanent court of arbitration. Uh, now, maybe a, a drawback is that uh, there are too many forums available and there is some confusion in how the jurisdiction is to apply. Uh, but I think another uh, great achievement of UNCLOS was to bring a good international dispute resolution forum to the table. Okay. All right, Ambassador. So yes. let me go back to the point that you were making initially and also a point that Sheetal Sharma was uh, making and take that particular aspect forward. You know, we spoke about how the Italian Marines case, of course, uh, through the spanner in the works really as far as the bilateral relationship is concerned. But looking at the larger picture of how this brought in the other EU players to the table as well. And, uh, you know, uh, suddenly it became an India-EU kind of an issue too. Oh, absolutely. In the big picture, we should always look at the big picture, uh, surely. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the EU is important, but as a practitioner, I would always say that the bilateral relationship is even more important. In the real world, the multilateral instruments are very important. UNCLOS is very important. But the bilateral relationship is the one that actually suffered. But of course, we uh, heard a very uh, good analysis from both my uh, panelists, uh, co-panelists, Abhishek and Sheetal, uh, about the legal and the political aspects and what happened at the EU. Uh, Mogherini leveraged this issue to get benefit for Italian national interest, period, in the, United, uh, in the uh, European Union. But uh, the same, uh, Mogherini, in 2019, after the reorganization, internal reorganization in Jammu and Kashmir, she was interviewed by an Indian channel and she was asked about it. She says, we completely in the EU, we understand India's security considerations. So this happens after the case is more or less resolved. As I said, you see, between the legal and the political, lots of things happen. The political had actually, political steps had actually preceded the legal steps in this case. What I mean is that the situation has already been diffused as far as the politics is concerned in 2016. And the ambassador uh, got access that he was denied after that. And don't forget also that we had two prime ministerial visits, um, Prime Minister Gentiloni in 2017 and Prime Minister Conte in 2018. Two successive years, two Italian prime ministers are coming to India. And here, of course, uh, I heard from uh, Sheetal that uh, the trade, etc., is not that substantial. But everything counts in a relationship. After all, our prime minister also went to Portugal, which uh, had a much less substantive relationship in terms of trade with India. So let me just give some figures. Uh, we heard that uh, correctly, 180,000 is the diaspora. It's significant. Number three in Europe after the UK and the Netherlands. Trade is $8.7 billion in 2018, and uh, the investment uh, from Italy is $3 billion uh, over the last 18 years. And Italy is number eight in the world as an economy. It's a $1 trillion economy. So it's a major player. It has defense platform. It has technologies that India can use. I can tell you this from direct knowledge of this. Uh, right. from some of my colleagues there. So it's a very important relationship. And after Brexit, how do we access uh, Europe? We put 50% of our investments in the UK. But the UK, you know, after Brexit, we have to look for other outlets for outward investments also, uh, for Indian investments in Europe. So for all these reasons, I would say looking at the big picture, Italy is a, an important part. Uh, it, it cannot be a, a partner that can be discounted. It is an important partner in the EU. Sure. But I'm not talking so much of the multilateral. I, I'm always going to emphasize the bilateral aspects more. Absolutely. All right. So talking about the bilateral aspect now, Sheetal, do you, know, do you believe that India can exert diplomatic pressure on Italy to ensure that justice is done by the Italian courts now going forward? 
Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, bilaterals are important uh, as compared to the multilaterals. And uh, uh, let's see these two things happening uh, on two parallel tracks. Uh, there are problems with other nations as well whenever we talk of bilateral and what better example can we take other than China, you know, uh, trade and all everything happening, yet we have so much of problems and sometimes tension uh, 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 growing between the two nations. Now, Italy, once again, being part of European Union, Fine, that's okay. But then when if we look at the bilaterals, yes, we have to invest in trade, we have to cooperate related to joint ventures and collaborations in the field of energy, in the field of renewable uh, energy sources, design and all those things which are giving us a cutting tech, uh, uh, cutting edge technology, you know, in terms of that. But now how do we move ahead in this direction and how do we ensure that Italy is going to give justice to? One was initially it was concurrent jurisdiction of both the countries in order to take the case, but now it has been turned in favor of Italy. Now, what to do? We must ensure, number one, that a proper compensation is being given to the victims. Number one, because the life of two fishermen is no less than the life of the two marines there. Number two, we have to see that the law of the land is adequately used, the issues are properly addressed. Number three, the case of immunity which has been uh, uh, given in favor of Italy, once again, I find this idea of immunity a bit stretched. Reason being that it was a commercial tanker, commercial ship, commercial contract, and it was on a commercial trip. So how do you see this idea of immunity being uh, imposed upon them. So we have to really see the legal angle in which our lawyer panelists would be able to throw light better that uh, to what extent immunity is applied in this case. Number three, if in case you give immunity in such kind of situations, even on commercial contracts and commercial ships, then what would be the case in future? Is it going to set a kind of precedence for rest of the things in future? Or it might set a bad example in future that somebody you suspect and you can uh, carry out something which is inhuman in nature. Number three is that there is still a confusion over what was the extent of the nautical miles. It was within Indian territorial water rather than even in uh, economic zones where we have some kind of control over the issues related to customs, immigration, uh, sanitary nations and, uh, you know, security and all that. So right. are we going to see and fight over those issues? And the thing is that we have to see that the law of the land prevails. And yes, appropriate action must be taken in order to give justice to the life of the people, those who have laid their life this time. So okay. we have to be uh, very careful in terms of using these concepts and understanding that how far they can be applied to certain situations. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I've got about five minutes left on the program. So time to get closing comments from all my guests. I'm going to ask you to be brief in a minute uh, per panelist, of course, the best way forward. Since Sheetal brought up this issue of uh, immunity, this is something that I would like to take forward with you, Abhishek, because you two raised it and briefly touched upon it in your opening remark as well. Officers of state, of course, enjoy immunity. What is the extent of, uh, extent of this immunity, I beg your pardon, and also who enjoys this immunity? Right. Uh, so when you come to the, to the concept of immunity, Frank, uh, you really have two schools of thought. You have one school of thought uh, in international law that says uh, when it comes to uh, international relations, uh, there is the concept of absolute immunity, which means a, a head of state uh, in uh, who's who's based in a in a in an embassy or uh, who's on a foreign mission uh, is is completely immune from any act, whether he commits any crime, it can be a human rights violation, can be any kind of crime. He enjoys absolute uh, immunity. Uh, the the other school of thought is is that no immunity is not absolute. Uh, you have to look at it more functionally. Are there exceptions to the rule? Uh, and we've seen this actually come up in different ways, even in the Deviani Cobra Garde case, where where the U.S. Uh, absolutely refused India's immunity claims in that particular case. Uh, so now, right. uh, I think I think the lines where the lines we're seeing in international law being drawn is that courts are now beginning when it's 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 international crimes, for example, drug trafficking uh, or labor trafficking. Uh, that's one exception that you're finding to this rule. Uh, you're also finding this exception, and this is what the U.S. used in the Deviani Cobra Garde case, is asking the question. Uh, what was that state official doing? Was that person doing uh, his or her act in official capacity? Or was it something that was not in official capacity, whether it was uh, sure. having a domestic help at home or outside the course of, of work? 
Uh, so I think that's where uh, India needs to be clear on what its immunity stand is, because of course we we do want to take a balanced approach. Uh, because remember, what we do here, there's always reciprocal action uh, in states abroad. So I think that's that's one very key aspect that needs to be looked at. Right. Uh, just another key aspect of just very quickly where we go from here. I think India has to has to look closely again with how it views its compatibility of international law uh, with domestic law. Uh, in this particular case, there were even issues that came up with the court saying that our maritime securities laws were in conflict with UNICLOS. Uh, thankfully, the court said that it was irrelevant to this case. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. sorting out some of those incompatibility issues uh, will kind of go in India's favor in the big picture. Uh, I, I'm really glad that India has accepted this verdict. Uh, and I think international right. cooperation and resolution to make sure we get our compensation uh, is going to be the way forward. Okay, all right. Talking about the way forward now, uh, Ambassador, is this a close chapter, do you think, really, as far as the ties between India and Italy are concerned and the nations can now look ahead? Well, uh, nothing is a close chapter until it becomes a close chapter. It's not a completely close chapter, but as I said, uh, and uh, Sheetal would bear me out, uh, the bilateral relationship, the political, diplomatic and strategic aspects override the purely legal aspects. And um, I would even dare to suggest, though I have no evidence to do so, that India is mighty relieved that this verdict has come. It's like something off your back. So we can have normal ties in a normal way. I like to compare this with two other similar cases. The South mm -hmm. China Sea, 2016, uh, Philippines, the Philippines took uh, uh, this case of the nine dash lines to the permanent court of arbitration, won the case. Now, these are binding. These verdicts are binding verdicts under law. But China said, quote unquote, it's null and void. And China got away with it. So China completely overthrew the verdict. Now, take the right. example of India and Bangladesh, 2015 maritime boundary. Now, India lost this meaning most of the territory went to Bangladesh and India very gracefully accepted this almost as a win-win situation. I would say the Italian case is closer to the India-Bangladesh case. Both the sides have taken a political call. After all, our concern is that two people have died and there should be, a, there should be proper compensation and a pop, proper legal redress and also for the ship, uh, the Anthony, the ship not just the, right. uh, the two human beings. So if that is addressed, I believe that it will be addressed given the trajectory of the relations that I've already spoken about. Two prime ministers mm -hmm. have taken this from Italy. So I'm not very pessimistic about the future of the relationship. The way forward, I think, is positive, good and bright. Okay, all right. And uh, Sheetal, close the show for us with your quick concluding remark. Concluding remarks, now it has to be ensured that the law takes legal course of action in an appropriate manner. Everything is at risk. Yes, despite some sad points between uh, two countries, the normal ties must go ahead. Number three, we require to step up our relations with uh, Italy in terms of trade as well as uh, in terms of sending students, uh, exchange, diaspora and rest of the things. There is a lot of potential and many of the areas in which Italy has a clear cut advantage as compared to the rest of the world and even in some cases the best in the world, we have to explore those areas and establish better relations in those areas because they blend well with some of the flagship programs of our current government like urban cities, smart cities and sanitation and all those things. So keeping these things aside, they both the things will run on parallel tracks. We have to ensure justice on this side as well. At the same time, strengthen our bilateral relations on the other track. Absolutely. All right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that uh, both nations will be happy to get some kind of closure as far as the Italian Marines case is concerned and will be looking ahead to the future.